Um, welcome. <laughs> I'm going to get up here and talk a little bit about uh, some research I've been doing on uh, LTE emissions. Um, not so much looking at, at protocol or data, but just uh, what can we see flying around in the air. And uh, I'm going to do it with RTL SDRs. Uh, a couple of people that have made this, uh, this talk happen or this story happen. Um, a few years ago, Melissa Elliott did a talk at DEF CON 21 on uh, crazy stuff in the noise floor that she was exploring with RTL SDRs. And uh, when I saw that talk, that inspired me to uh, take up that research on you know, what fun bits of data are flying around there. Um, also, uh, Juha Vernon, um, if, if you're here, I'd love to talk to you and shake your hand. Um, this guy's done a tremendous amount of research on fixing a lot of the uh, clock drift problems when you're trying to synchronize two RTL SDRs. Um, I used everything that he did to get to where this talk is. Um, so we're going to go down this road. Um, it's going to wind a lot, of, uh, a lot of different places. Start with a little bit of history on direction finding, uh, on radio exploitation, uh, just straight RF, why do we care? Um, I'm going to give you a quick primer on time of arrival direction finding. Uh, then I'm going to talk about why the uh, RTL SDR is a terrible um, radio. <laughs> and then uh, go over some of the processes I'm using to do direction finding with uh, RTLs. Uh, so, you know, here we are. We have a boat in the water that's really hard to see. Um, you know, you're a 1940 Battle of the Atlantic, World War II. Um, how do we find the U-boats? Uh, they have these antenna masts on the top that occasionally, when they pop out of the water, uh, emit signals. Um, those signals are, you know, encoded messages, encrypted messages, but they are still RF emissions. Uh, anyone can pick them up. You don't have to be able to decrypt them to, uh, you know, put up your antenna and receive that data. Um, so then we get a whole lot of these guys. Uh, they put cans on their head and they turn a whole bunch of knobs and try to figure out uh, what the position of that signal is through a few different kinds of techniques um, using very expensive, very large equipment. Uh, the wavelengths on um, these transmissions were huge. Uh, so to do direction finding, you needed like national infrastructure um, or at least real estate um, to park lots and lots of antennas. Uh, today we have this guy. He's on the Wikipedia page for fox hunting, um, which has become the modern approach to direction finding. Uh, it's a really fun thing if you haven't gotten into it where somebody goes and puts a radio out in a state park and you get your antenna and, and your headphones and you go and try and find it. Um, so there he is, and I guess you need a, you know, trendy headband. Um, so it's going to get a little technical. Um, this is how direction finding happens with time of arrival. Um, the principle here, like the the main piece of math that's going to happen, is we're going to have two antennas or two antennae that are going to receive the same signal, and then we're going to compare the time difference. Um, of that signal arriving at the antenna to get a line of bearing to the transmitter. Um, so basically what happens is the transmitter fires off a signal. Um, this is obviously something that you have to have a really bursty or uh, discrete signal. If it's always transmitting, you can't catch the time of arrival um, as easily. Uh, receiver A has a, uh, a timestamp for when the signal hits. Receiver B then has a slightly later timestamp and we have, uh, let's see, an identical signal traveling at, uh, or the same signal traveling at the same speed through a, uh, a constant atmosphere. So a lot of assumptions here uh, to arrive at two known positions. Um, based on the distance between the receivers <laughs> and uh, the distance in the time of arrival or the difference in the time of arrival, um, you can create a hyperbola uh, that shows all the possible locations of the transmitter. We don't care about modeling the actual hyperbola. I just want to know what the asymptotes are. So if you dig back into your, uh, your high school trig, if you just take the you know, cosine of that angle of attack or that line of bearing, uh, it's going to be the time of arrival divided by the distance uh, between the two points. Um, so using that, we can draw two um, 
possible lines that this transmitter can be from. If you only have two receivers, you're always going to have two different places to guess and go look for it. Um, so uh, how do we solve that problem and get to position? Um, this is classic triangulation. Uh, when you know, people are saying, I'm going to triangulate your signal, three antennas, a little bit of trigonometry, um, and we get a shape that looks like this, where we have three receivers. They're all getting time of arrival measurements. We're going to take those same uh, cosines of the, uh, of the angles to get six lines. Three of the lines are going to diverge off into space. Hopefully, three of the lines are going to converge. Uh, if you've got clock drift in your radios, if you have really terrible RTL SDRs that you're using as your receivers, um, sometimes all six lines diverge, and you just have to wait for uh, everything to sync up. Um, so we've talked about the history of direction finding. I've given you a little bit on uh, the math that's behind time of arrival. Um, how many of you guys have heard of an RTL SDR? Awesome. OK. Um, they're cheap. That's something that I really like about playing with them, especially if I need three of them. I'm not going to go out and get three blade RFs to do um, a pet time of arrival project on a couple of weekends. Um, it, it's a lot of budget for an entry level uh, exercise. But the RTL SDRs, I was like, all right, they're like $16 on the internet, so how bad can they be? Um, I'm using the E4000s because I was interested in tracking LTE signals and I had to get up into the higher band. Uh, if you buy a brand new RTL SDR, like just straight off of Amazon, uh, it's a newer chip that doesn't tune all the way up to uh, LTE 1900, which is what we have here in Las Vegas. So. Uh, this project with newer radios, you got to find a place where they're using the uh, the 800 band LTE. Um, but yeah, this is the the E4000 on the right. Um, on the left is the stock terrible antenna that comes with the uh, the E4000. Um, but that stock terrible antenna and the E4000 are able to pick up uh, clean you know, ADSB signals, which is what's coming off the airplanes to the air traffic control to show uh, you know, their heading and position and uh, flight identifiers, that kind of information. If you go on Reddit and you get in the RTL SDR community and say, I want to pick up ADSB, everyone's going to tell you, you've got to get a, a better antenna and you've got to run you know, wires out to your house and get it high up in the air and throw away the antenna that comes with your chip. Don't do any of that. <laughs> Just Use the stock antenna uh, when you're getting started playing. It's a, it lowers that initial investment, and it works. I mean, this was live data from uh, actually from here this morning. Um, yeah, it's not garbage. Um, it's terrible, but it's not garbage. So <laughs> if you want to get started, it, uh, it will work. Um, so. This is my disclaimer. I am not a, uh, a radio guy by trade. Um, I've definitely done a lot of analysis of pre-collected signals, but digital signal processing is uh, not my, my formal education. Uh, so I'm about to do a lot of terrible things. Let's do direction finding with the RTL SDR. Um, so we said before that we need to have three antennas to do position direction finding. So I'm just going to buy three of these $16 things, hook them all up to my PC, and this is just going to work, right? There's, there's my uh, RTL SDR. I'm going to replace each of the transmitters in my original diagram, or sorry, each of the receivers with RTLs. Um, and it's just going to work. It's not going to work. Um, one of the major problems with these is the uh, oscillator is extremely sensitive to temperature. Um, if you have like a fan blowing near your computer and you have two RTLs sitting next to each other and one's getting the fan more directly than the other, your center frequencies can start to drift um, very quickly, which breaks time of arrival. Um, there's also issues with the clock. Um, because they're coming in over USB, if you try to sync two of these devices on the system with the CPU, there's bus lag from the USB, uh, there's clock drift across the devices, the temperature sensitive oscillator is just going to break down all your calculations. You're going to attempt to geolocate something, and it's going to tell you that it's 25,000 miles away. and it doesn't make any sense. Um, so what do we do about clock synchronization? 
This is where U.S. work came in. Um, he had spent a lot of time trying to solve this problem. Turns out that the uh, the reference for the um, the RTLs that have come out has a uh, a pin that you can use for clock in. So all you've got to do is crack open your sixteen dollar radio and uh, solder on the uh, clock out from one of them onto the other two. And now suddenly you're using the same system clock for all three devices. You're not trying to sync on the CPU, and you can actually do a little bit of direction finding if you get a good signal. Um, and there's a rig with three uh, RTLs sharing a single clock. Um, so like I said before, it doesn't make the RTL a great radio. It's still bad, uh, but with a little bit of clock sync and math uh, and good signals, and that's what I'll get into next, is what kind of signals does this work with, um, you can go and uh, direction find devices using a couple of RTLs, three RTLs. Uh, bursty digital comms. This is where it works. Uh, and this is where we get into why I chose LTE. Um, when I was surveying the space around uh, where I live, there are a lot of LTE uplinks, and I thought, hey, that would be really cool if I could use my triangulation technique to track all of the cell phones. Um, and some of them are cars, and some of them are other devices, but basically I'm assuming if it's LTE and it's uplink and I can receive it, it's probably a phone. Um, GSM's also good, it's pretty wide. Um, it's, not, uh, uh, it's not as loud, it's closer to the noise floor, and the RTLs uh, really struggle with that because they, everything looks like noise on one with the stock antenna. Uh, CB radio is pretty good too, just because it's super loud. Um, you get a very clear signal when you're trying to play with this. Uh, walkie talkies are the same way. Um, a lot of construction guys around us that I've been able to put very, precise dots on where they're sitting in their, uh, their yellow iron. Um, one of the other things that's kind of exciting, uh, this was a signal that I collected in the US, and you'll see that it's in the 900 uplink. Well, maybe you can see, it's, there's some numbers right there. Um, that's not a licensed band for, uh, for GSM in the US, that's a European channel. Um, so this was a signal that I was interested in geolocating because obviously somebody is uh, using a system that either is completely undocumented or um, they shouldn't be. Uh, and because the width of the signal is, um, is fairly wide, unlike kind of the walkie-talkie CB stuff that gets very narrow, uh, if the clocks drift on the RTLs or the oscillators drift and my center frequencies get off, my time of arrival is still the same. And I'm gonna show that, that if I have one RTL where the true center frequency is slightly to the left of where I'm trying to tune it, and another that's slightly to the right, I'm still going to get the same time of arrival. Um, so that's why you know, LTE is, is easy to track with three RTLs. Um, and that's, that's my research uh, so far. I'm going to be uh, hanging out at the Wireless Village tomorrow. If anybody wants to see this thing fly, um, my Kibana box does not plug into a VGA, so um, I'm not going to show it live in here. But uh, yeah, thanks for coming out. Thank you.